Thank you, Stefan. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, a kind of uh, warning from my side. I'm, I'm, I'm not here to, to explain you anything. I'm here just to ask for help, right? Because, in fact, we are developing a, a vision for open science that has a number of uh, building blocks and a number of, uh, of um, actions that we intend to, to, to lead. And one of the, it's like a puzzle with a lot of pieces, and one of the pieces that, that is missing and that we would like to establish the link is exactly open source. It's, it's, it's you, your community. But I will, I will get down to there. So I will just very briefly tell you what we, we think is open science. A building block on, on, on open access is one of the building blocks of our vision. And then a, a couple of words about what is the message, what do we need from, from you as a community. For us, for us, open science is a transformation process that is happening, that, that started a couple of years ago. And uh, it's, it's enabled by the usage of information and communication technologies and touches the, the process of uh, making science, the process, the research at the end. The, the idea is that science will become more efficient, transparent, and above all, interdisciplinary. In fact, we want to go from the idea of a change, a pure change in process. If you, if you remember, Darwin was using a kind of citizen science already at, at his time. He was asking the citizens to observe the species that will send, and then the people would write in a postcard what they had observed and were sending back to Darwin. We do not, we do not think that open science is just using a smartphone, filming the species and sending to Darwin over uh, Darwin's Facebook page. It's not only this. The fact is that we believe that new disciplines are emerging that come from the, the mixture, the real interdisciplinarity and not the multidisciplinarity in science. Uh, a bit as if what we observe today, this is a, a, a drawing that represents the scientific process uh, as it has always been. Today, there are a number of things that happen around. There is open access, there is open code, there is citizen science, there is data intensive science, there is open data, there are annotations, there is a multiplicity of things that the technology allows, allows us to use. And around this, there are a number of systems that allow us to, to, to use this, this type of, uh, of culture or, or philosophy, I would call it a mindset. I mean, this uh, is a kind of uh, an anarchical picture, but what we see is that there is an emerging ecosystem of services that are provided to the scientific community and of standards that enable these services to be used in, in, in a common way. Our vision tries to put a bit of structure on this. It's probably a quite simplified uh, vision, but I, I like it be because it has uh, several dimensions. The first, of all, first dimension that I would like to transmit to you is what do we mean by open? Well, if we think that uh, open science, the, the principles will be multidisciplinarity and collaboration between scientists, on the other side we have a building block of accessibility and reusability, which is our open access policy. If we look at these two blocks, the word open means transparent, right? If we add the third block, which is the, the focus on the benefits for society of science, and we think about this linked to, to the open access, we open gets the, the, the meaning of trusted, right? If in addition to this, we add the, the level of participation, engagement of the citizen in the scientific development process, in the policy making process, then open means engaging. And if we look at the participatory di dimension and the collaborative dimension, we see that open means borderless. Of course, you will tell me science has always mean, been borderless. It's true, but the, the meaning of the word borderless has evolved with time also. 
Now, what do we see as challenges for, for our vision of open science? We see a big challenge on, on what we call infrastructures, in particular for big data analytics and, and, and for high performance computing and so on and so forth. We see another challenge, which is open access, open access to research results, but also open access to the processes. And this is where I, I hope that we can establish a link between your community and us, is that open access to processes is open source. We have another dimension of evidence-based policy making that we, in our jargon, call global system science. This is mainly the appreciation that the, the societal challenges as they are, as, as we are facing them today, are global in, in, in two senses of the word global. They are global because they cannot be addressed by a country or a region, but they are also global because they cannot be addressed by a discipline. And the proof of this is the recent financial crisis. I mean, all the mathematical models for the, the financing world have collapsed with the crisis. Be why? Because they, did, they were purely economical models. They had forgotten other types of dimensions, in particular the societal dimension. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. And then our fourth block is the citizen engagement, citizen science. And you will hear about this in, in, in the, the presentations that, we've, that, that follow us. When we talk about citizen science, we mean the involvement of the citizens in the scientific process at different stages. I mean, from the financing of science, the strategy of science, which is the allocation of the resources to the domains in which the, the, the governments as the main funders of, of science want to invest, and then the, the scientific process itself. A bit like the, the type of challenges that we see there are of the, the following kind. Uh, for example, the, the, the financing of science today happens, I mean today and since a number of centuries, is, is, is done like this. There is a big hand, and this big hand is called taxation, that gets into the pocket of people, picks up the money, and then says to the owner of the pocket, you have nothing to say about the usage of your money, because those guys out there that are the scientists, they know better than you what to do with your money. Do you actually believe that this model is sustainable when the owner of the pocket comes from the Facebook generation? I mean, people that are used to give their advice independently of the fact that they understand the question or not? I don't think so. I think that if we do not address this dimension of the citizen, we are putting in question science itself, right? So when we come back to the challenges with regard to infrastructures for us, the, the, the challenges are no limitations of access by discipline, by, by nationality, by whatever and what we call the virtual research environments, which are ways of having the scientists together without being together physically. On open access, we, we, we have open access to publications, and there we are looking at alternative publishing models. We have open access to scientific data and metadata. We have open source as the next step, open access to algorithms, methods, and tools. And we have a dimension of text and data mining, which is quite in interesting because it's linked to all our policy on copyright. On uh, evidence-based policy making, we have the, the link between science and society in policy decisions. It's a bit like a contract between, I mean, we, we have, always observed them, and, and I'm, I'm an old guy in the, in the European Commission, so we have always complained that there is a distance between the citizen and Europe. And we have tried plenty of ways to, 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 to bridge this gap, to approach the citizen. We have not tried science yet, and this is what we, we, we try to, to, to promote today. <clears throat> and then, as, as a more as a more, I would say, technological challenge, we have the, this societal data deluge that, that is given by the, the, the data that we consider private, like our health data, the data that we consider as, as private but for the companies, like the, the data that Google has about us, that Facebook has about us, that Amazon has about us, and then there is the scientific data. So we are in a data-intensive world but our algorithms are not data intensive. So there is a, a mathematical problem of modeling. It's not only about doing the same thing, but bigger. It's about doing something different. On the citizen engagement, 
uh, our main challenge is to say how can we go from isolated anecdotes like Galaxy Zoo, for example. It was very nice. It allowed uh, thousands of people to see millions of, of, of telescope images. So what? What's next? Is this, is this, did this way of, of, of using the citizen as, as an observatory <coughs> of data, is, has this become a method? The answer is not. We, we have a plenty of examples, some of them even in projects that we are, that we are financing. But these are, these are just examples. We don't have a methodology to involve the citizen at particular stages in the scientific process. And then we have the question of the financing of research. I mean, this uh, is, is something which, which, which is a vision that, that has dimensions that are orthogonal to all of this. And one of them is the alternative metrics for science and research, and in particular, the open peer review. I mean, we know that it's very nice to address all the challenges in the blocks, but if we do not create the, the, the mechanism for rewarding certain types of openness and some certain types of, of, of collaboration, we will not get anywhere. If, if we do all this, our, like for example, our open access policy, and we continue to evaluate the researchers according to the impact factor, this will be a major fiasco. I mean, it will be the end of, of, of openness. So there is work that needs to be done on, on alternative metrics. And the other is science for innovation. I mean, we, we believe, and we have an initiative called START, which stands for Science, Technology, and Art. We believe that the, the, the creativity is the basis for innovation. And for example, we are now starting a, 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 a direction of thinking that says, if we sponsor residents of artists in our projects as a funding agency, we are bringing to these projects a different way of looking at things. And this might lead to other, to, to other types of innovation, to other types of products. And this is not new. Apple is doing this. Today, uh, Mercedes is doing this. For example, in, 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 the, in the research that Mercedes is doing today for the, the fully automated car, one of the things that is lost is the eye contact between the pedestrian and the driver of the car. When the car will have no driver, where is the eye contact between the, the, the two? And they are using artists to innovate on what can replace the eye contact between the pedestrian and the driver in a fully automated car. So we intend to, to pursue this type of, uh, of, of endeavors towards innovation, is what we call science for innovation. Of course, that all this means that there is a change in culture, there is a change in mindset. And we, as, as, as civil servants, we are not there to come and say to the scientists, oh, listen, by the way, you have since 300 years done science like this, but now you better do it like that. It's not the purpose. The purpose is to be the catalyzers of change, not only with regard to researchers, but with regard to the research institutions, is the case of the evaluation of science, and with regard to industry itself. Now, a word about open access. This is our standard slide. It has a, a, a purely, I would say, economic uh, motivation. We say, why open access? Because the taxpayer has already paid the scientific work. The taxpayer pays the scientist when he writes the paper. The taxpayer pays the peer reviewers when they do the, the, the peer reviewing. Why should the taxpayer pay for the subscription to the magazine where the scientist will read what he has written with the money of the taxpayer? It's abnormal in our view. So this is the basis for our, our open access policy. It has several dimensions, open access to publications. Here it's very easy, it's a mandate. So all publications, I mean, now I'm talking because the commission has several hats. Now I'm putting the hat of the research funder. And our tool to fund research is Horizon 2020. In Horizon 2020, as far as publications are concerned, the, the, the policy is very simple. There is a mandate. Everything that you publish should be in open access. We have already paid for it. We should not pay again. So this is the, the, the philosophy. Of course, we are agnostic. We have no religion. We are not gold nor green. We are no matter which color. So we allow for the two models. The important thing is that the philosophy behind is openness. Now what we have added in Horizon 2020 
is the, the idea of, of promoting that the authors, when they put a paper in open access, they deposit also the data underpinning the paper. And this is an important thing that has a lot of links to text and data mining, as, as I, I have told you before. Now, we are on the open access to research data. This is another challenge, a totally different challenge, totally different because it's, it's, uh, it's really a different, uh, a different business, open access to scientific data with regard to open access to publications. We are in the beginning of the process, so what we have done is to launch an open research data pilot in Horizon 2020. This pilot has a scope, this pilot has a definition of data, what type of data is covered by the, the pilot. This, uh, the major objective of, of, of this pilot is to promote the idea that when you do a scientific project, the data management principles, policy, whatever, that you utilize, it's important to be thought, uh, thought in advance. And there are specific requirements for the projects participating for, to the pilot. If you are familiar with, with Horizon 2020, you can read this very easily. This is the list of the areas within Horizon 2020 that are linked to the pilot, that, that are, that for which the projects participate to the pilot. Now, we decided to do this on a work program basis because the work program is dynamic, it changes its two years instead of doing it in the program, in the legislation, because in order to change legislation at the community level, it's a process. I mean, it's a time consuming, energy consuming, consuming everything process. So we, we decided to do it at the work program level. In this way, it gives us a certain reactiveness because we say if those areas are not answering in the way we expect them to answer, then we can switch and add others, remove, and so on and so forth for the future. The, all the other actions, by the way, in Horizon 2020 can participate to the project on a voluntary basis, and all the actions in these areas can opt out of the, pro of the pilot in particular conditions like privacy, uh, defense reasons, and so on and so forth. So there is, there is a whole concept behind the, the, the pilot. Now, what are, what are the types of data concerned? The first is underlying data or underpinning data, so it's the data linked to the publications, as I mentioned before. The, the other type of data is everything else, provided that it's, it's described in a data management plan. And this is the real, the real focus that, you have, that we have, is on the data management plan. Our purpose is not that all the projects participating to the pilot will put all the data sets they generate in open access. Our purpose is to start a reflection on the value of data, the usage of data, the reusage of data, the metadata principles that are used in scientific disciplines, data interoperability, and so on and so forth. So the idea is to say, the projects participating to the pilot, the first obligation that they have is to deliver a data management plan that addresses those five issues at the end of the slide in the first six months of the project. We were even thinking in the beginning of going one step further, like the, like the NIH or the NSF in the US, in which they say, when you submit a proposal for a grant, you have to have a data management plan. But we, you know, we, we have a different approach to the ones of the Americans, and we said we don't want to be perceived as putting administrative burdens on our proponents. So we say you need to deliver within the first six months, and we pay for it, right? So this is a way of diminishing the investments that the proposers have to do in order to submit a proposal. Let me remind you that our rejection rate is, is very high, so that's one of the policy considerations that we have. <clears throat> Those are the requirements for the, the, the projects that, uh, that participate in the pilot. I just draw your attention, otherwise my, my talk would be too long. I would just like to draw your attention that the obligation is not to open all the data sets that you produce. The, 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 the obligation is to provide the data management plan and to follow it. And of course, that this data management plan, it's not a frozen document that you produce in the first six months of the project and that stays 
unchanged till the end. This is a, a dynamic document that will be changed w w at different moments in time whenever there is a need. And the idea is to say there are certain data sets that are generated by a project that can be immediately made open. There are other that need to be anonymized, that need plenty of other things before they are made open, or due, for example, to, to national security or, or defense reasons, they can never be made open. So, but anyway, what is important is the reflection that you need to have in order to come back to these solutions. It's not just to say, for example, it's not just to say in photonics, if I make open the data of experiments that I do with a laser, this will allow my competitors to have the same laser than me. This is not enough as a, as, a, as a reflection, right? You need to explain why. What is in your data that allows your competitors to have the same laser than you? Now, we had already had certain calls for Horizon 2020, so we, we, we made the first preliminary with, with exclamation point. Preliminary analysis, of course, that this is just a numeric analysis. There is no... <coughs> <coughs> no data analytics behind. So the idea is to say that the opt-out, which is proposals that say since the submission time, we don't want to be in the pilot, accounted for 24.2%. On the other hand, proposals that say we were not under the scope of the pilot, but we would like to participate to the pilot amounts to 27.2%, which is a quite interesting analysis in itself because the pilot is not linked to the evaluation of the proposals, as it is in the states in the NIH or the, in the NSF. The, the, the idea is that the, the openness is something that is orthogonal to the quality of the proposal, right? A proposal is not better because it opens more data sets than another one that opens only one, right? The idea is, is, is to say that the data management approach has to be sound. And this is something that, that is more on the lifetime of the project rather than on the evaluation of the proposal. Uh, we have not done the, the, the analysis on the reasons, and that would be an interesting thing to, to, to report on, but it's not yet done. The important thing, and this is the message that I would like to leave with, uh, with you because you are potential uh, candidates to, to Horizon 2020, is that to participate in the pilot is the way to influence our policy for the future, because our policy on, on open access to data will be defined based on the analysis of the pilot. So the ones that will opt, that will opt out from the pilot, they are not influencing anything. The others, the others that, say, that stay in, even though they close their data sets, right, those are influencing our policy. Now, I come back to the, to the difficult part of my, of my, of my talk, which is, open source. Now, we, we started our open access policy from the publications. There was a pilot in FP7. There is now a mandate in Horizon 2020. We continued with the open access to data. We are launching the pilot today. We might have a policy for the successor of Horizon 2020, whatever it will be called. Uh, now we are thinking that linked to the open access to data, there is the question of the open access to the algorithms, to the methods, to the tools, because sometimes data by itself is, is unusable. You need to have the code that, that, that can be used in order to reuse the data. And this, for me, is open source. So this, this is the link that I would like to, 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 to establish with you. What we observe when you look, we look at our projects is that open source soft and hardware is a pervasive thing. We have a number of examples of, of, of projects that th those names that are there are projects from our uh, portfolio of projects. In the Internet of Things, there are projects that, that use this type of approaches. In cloud computing, there are projects that use these types of approaches. In project management, we have a number of projects that use this. In education, because if you look at our vision, and now I go back a, a number of slides. If you look at our vision, you would say there is one big dimension missing there, which is the dimension of education, because in fact, education, education is the other side of the coin of, 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 of science, right? 
And this is because education is a very difficult subject for us because it's under what we call subsidiarity. It's, it's the prerogative of the member states. So each time that we try to put our hand in the education field, there is a big hammer that comes and says, no, this is us, this is not you. So, but anyway, education is, is, is a worry for us. And then there are a number of, of projects in the data analytics domain that, that use uh, open source or open code uh, mindsets. So we believe that open source is, is another piece in the open science puzzle. Uh, the feeling comes from the fact that it's open, it's unlimited and free access, it's reusable, it's modifiable, it's improvable, it's, you can use a, a different number of, of adjectives on this. The, the idea is to say that it's similar to, to, to everything else that we are doing in, in, in open science. And then there is the dimension of, of, of collaborativeness, which for us, it's one question it's one uh, item that is linked to the quality of science, whatever that is, right? Uh, and now comes the, the even more difficult part for, for, for me. We all, we all acknowledge that this is true, I mean, that, that, that science needs software, right? Well, my question is, when science will be open science, what are the links that go from open science to the others. Probably we need to think about this. And this is the main message that I would leave to you, is that we have the feeling that open source is a piece of our puzzle. We have a number of actions that we are financing that are linked in a way or another to open source. And we think that open source will be a piece of the puzzle. Now we need your help. And that's for us what we believe. Open source and open science at the end of the day, it's a mindset. And what I'm here to do is to say, uh, your help is needed, please. So we, we are not teaching anything. We are, we are just saying we think about this and we would like to have a link with you, right? And there in my last slide, you have a, a list of websites and so on and so forth that are the basis for, for our thinking. Thank you very much. Well, I forgot to say, but it goes without saying. If you have questions, I will do my best to, to, to answer, right? Any question? Yes. Excuse me. I'm trying to contribute to uh, your last question. Huh? Uh, I think one of the important uh, needs for open science is what you said about data interoperability. You know, I think it's really mandatory to have interoperability. If you want to be able to reuse data, you need interoperability. So. Uh, interoperability, uh, open source is not a mandatory feature for interoperability. You can de de develop interoperability without open source. However, I think that it helps. So that could be also one of the main links that we can, we can share. Thank you. Uh, we, we, this data interoperability, uh, we, we have a, um, a sort of image in open source saying everybody can use a, a, a pen to write. So what is more important is uh, that I can write, so open data, I can read what you write, but as well I can build the, the pen, everybody knows, and I can use any pen, in fact, what is really important is that I can take any kind of pen, of pencils, and I can write. So it's interoperability is really something you, you should not miss in the, in the puzzle, otherwise it's not going, well, there is something missing. I, I agree with, uh, with Bertrand. Any other question? Ah, yes. My name is Stefan Dubeda. Thank you very much for this very nice call, uh, talk. So uh, to complete the, the question about code, uh, maybe there is a question behind, but uh, it's more of a complimentary comment there. Um, the, a code or program is a living to object, so it's very difficult to to say that I will be I put it somewhere. You have to to run the code in an environment, and you have to to also to freeze the environments. Uh, so that makes things complicated to to leave the code and say that I will be successful to run it again and ten years later. So we really need also some tools to. To um, let's say to, to have some uh, dynamics uh, code management system at the, the European level, for example, like uh, Forge or things like that. Uh, so it's, it's, it's I think the key things to to, to save code. So I, I have also some small question, uh, more about the philosophy. Uh, if I want to go to the 
to the main uh, uh, open science challenge questions. There is some listed question I have on this uh, on this slide. Uh, when you put in the uh, major challenge uh, the link with the citizens, you put on the, on the slide a, a, a sentence which uh, I want to know what what's behind this sentence. Uh, you link citizens to a new way of funding research. Uh, I don't know exactly what you are meaning by that. So could you give us some yes. detail on this? Yes, I, I can develop a bit on this. It's a bit what, uh, what, what I had said about the big hand and the, the financing of science, you see. The, the idea is to say that we, we need to involve the, the, the citizens in the establishment of priorities for the investments in science, right? Th this is one, one, one item, is to involve the citizens, to, to ask them, and, and here we have plenty of problems linked to the identification of citizens, to the fact that not everybody is either intellectually or educationally supplied in the same way to answer the question. So there are plenty of problems that we need to solve, but what we feel is that there is a need to hear the citizen in the, in the establishment of the priorities for science. The other is very simple, is to say, why not use principles of crowd financing for science, right? This would really mean, I mean, you, you put your heart or you put your, 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 your coins where your heart is, right? And this is something that, that has not yet been tried. So one of the things that we are thinking about is, for example, when we define the prices and we will try to identify a number of prizes for, for science inside Horizon 2020, is to say probably not only the definition of the areas in which we attribute the prizes should be crowdsourced, but also the money that we attribute in the prizes should be crowdfinanced. But this is just the beginning of the thinking. That's why I wrote that sentence there. We, 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 as, as a philosophy, are in, 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 the print, in, in the beginning, right? It's not, that, that's why I told you I, I risk to disappoint you at the end of the day, because I'm not going to present anything apart from ideas and, and, and principles for a philosophy. If you have meaning. No, I, I wanted to, I understand these new ways of funding. Uh, from the, imagine from the e-infrastructure side, the millions of millions of euros invested in supercomputing power and network of sensors and so on for smart cities, for environmental monitoring and so on. And now <laughs> think the, the, the cost of setting up a network of resources, a pool of resources from the contribution of uh, volunteers, of citizens. Um, this is, this, there is a huge gap of funding models, right? And, and deployment scale also, the, the, the speed of, it is of deployment. So I understand also it is very efficient to ask people to contribute with the resources, and this is, can be understood a new way of funding. Science, you, don't, you can't uh, donate something with crowdfunding, but you can also donate your computer for uh, volunteer computing, for instance. That's a very interesting point. We, we have received uh, some while ago a question uh, from the outside world on our reaction exactly to this. There is, there is a network of high performance computing that is built on private PCs. So you put your private PC on the network and it's accessible over the network to everybody that has a, a, a need for, for computing power in a coordinated way with conditions and so on and so forth. This, for me, is providing resources. It's, it's a way of, of, of funding in, in, in the large sense of the word funding, right? Funding is not only giving money to, can be providing infrastructures to. Any other question? Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Uh, we have developed a virtual research environment for biologists and uh, when, you, when we talk about open data, uh, it seems that they are very reluctant to give away their data. And you talk about alternative metrics for science and research. And uh, can you elaborate uh, about this? Well, I, I, I can try to give you an idea of our thinking. Of course, that the, the scientific community, and, and, and this again depends very much on the disciplines, right? There are certain disciplines where to, 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 to collect data or to produce data is so expensive that your only chance to, to work on it is to share it. And, and a concrete example is the CERN. 
The, the are, there are other disciplines, and this is true when we approach the social sciences and humanities uh, domain, where it's very complicated to, 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 to try to motivate people to share their data, because they believe that if they have the data that allowed them to publish in Nature a first article, it might allow them to publish a second and a third, and therefore, if they put it on the public domain, <laughs> it's not exactly the, the best approach for their careers. And this is what I feel it's wrong, right? What we feel it's wrong is that we need to reward people in a different way, in, in a way that is different from the way in which they publish, okay? For example, the impact factor, everybody knows, was something developed a, a couple of hundreds of years ago in order to say, uh, well, the libraries need to subscribe to certain journals, so we need to have an index of quality of the journals in order to help the libraries to decide which journals they subscribe to and which they don't. And this became, over the time, the way to judge the people that publish in the journals, right? It's a bit abnormal. The, the counting of the citations for me, it's also a bit abnormal because the fact that you are quoted 300 times has very little sense if 200 of 99 of them are to say that you are stupid, right? I mean, on the opposite, when you are quoted just 10 times and all of them are to say that you are great, it's probably best. Or, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm making a caricature, of course, but the idea is to say that we do not qualify the quotations, right? We just count them. And there is something wrong with this process, right? The other is to say that at the end of the day, uh, publishers are, are entities that were born from the need to, to communicate knowledge and therefore the need to, to, to have a virtual circle on knowledge, that knowledge provides knowledge that will provide knowledge that will increase knowledge. And today they belong to, to pension funds in Singapore. I mean, there is something wrong also on this process. There is a kind of, of, of merchandising of science that for us that look at it from the, the, the philosophical perspective, and now I take the hat of the European civil servant because I'm going a bit too far. I put the hat of myself, right? The, the, there is a bit of a, a, an effet pervers on the, on the scientific development process that, that brings uh, egoism, that brings egocentrism, that brings megalomania. So, I mean, th there, is, there is something that is deteriorating, and it's our, our responsibility as funders of science and your responsibility as scientists to do something about it. And that's why I use the word catalyze. We are not here to, to do science. If I could do science, I would be a scientist and not a civil servant, right? I'm just here to catalyze processes. And, and the idea is that we observe that these processes are ongoing. We observe some, some I, I would almost dare to say, alarming statistics that come to us. For example, today the number of PhD students in China has depassed the whole of the labor force in the US. I, and we say, if we don't do anything, and it's a sentence that we had discussed just before the session, I mean, if we don't do anything, the wave is forming. Do we want to, to, to ride the wave, or do we want to influence the wind that is making the wave? That's the question that I will leave with you. As, as, as a, a number contributor to policy making, I would say I would prefer to act on the wind than to be very good at riding the wave. But Any other question? Yeah. Uh, there is two. So, uh, uh, I come back after to you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, last year I was in a panel discussion at the Open uh, World Forum and uh, we talked about uh, how to launch open source project and uh, we, the question was asked whether the European Union could, uh, could mandate a uh, software oriented project to, to deliver their results in open source. And the question was raised uh, uh, among the people was how to, to make successful open source project. And we said that the um, successful project, uh, some many successful projects are hosted by large foundations like uh, Mozilla, Eclipse, or others. And uh, what is your uh, view on this for this uh, uh, open source, uh, open sourcing of all these uh, science results? What would be the role of such foundation, existing foundation or foundation to be created? 
Well, again, I, I, I probably take my hat of civil servant out and, and leave my, my personal one on, on my head. It's very difficult for, for policy making to, to make policy by mandates, right? Uh, we, we tried to do that with regard to open access to publications because we felt that you need to shake the tree in order that, that the, the, the fruits fell down, right? And that you can have access to them. So that's a way that we followed. For data, we, we were afraid of doing this. And for software, we are probably even more afraid of, of doing this than, 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 than for data. So the, the question of saying we put a mandate on the, uh, for example, we could imagine that you put a mandate by saying each time that you generate code in your project, it will need to be made available to, to everybody. I have the feeling that the, the, the first how can I say that, that the first result of this type of policy, of, of making policy by mandates, will, will be the industrial participation in the project. We, we had the problem with our open data pilot. Uh, when I went to the parliament and so on and so forth to, to, to explain uh, the, the, our principles for launching the pilot, I had industry on, other, on the other side of the table saying, but you are crazy. If you go ahead with that, we will never participate to your projects, right? And this is not totally false, because it's an argument that you, you need to hear. Because if you look at the NIH in the US, they have done a, a mandatory policy on open access to data. And the, 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 they are no longer financing industry, of course. For the NIH, they couldn't care less because already the NSF is not financing industry. So for them, it's very, it's, it's very simple to say we align with the NSF and couldn't care less about industry. After all, the pharmaceutical industry, they have well the means to finance their own, their own research. But we are not in that position. We have a research program that is included in the growth and jobs priority of the European Union, right? So we, we cannot go very far. Another example of, the, of the, the hesitation that we have on making policy by mandates is with regard to open access to, to publications. We, we have received recently a, a, a report from colleagues in DG Justice to tell us that we need to be very prudent with our open access policy because there are ethic imp implications, namely implications on the freedom of, of science, right? with regard to the human rights, with regard to the, the, the rights of the scientists, and so on and so forth. And there we had to, to, to justify in plenty of pages of text that, in fact, this is not the case, because our mandate for open access is not a mandate for publication, right? It's, it, it, it interferes only after the decision of, publi of, of, of publishing, right? So we are not saying to the people, you are obliged to publish, and that publication has to be open access. We are just saying to the people, if you decide to publish, which is not mandatory, then it has to be open access. It's a very delicate political balance that we, we always need to, 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 to ensure. So uh, doing policy by mandate is, is, is very, I, I would be very hesitant, right? Yeah, thank you. So it's just about open data. So I like very much the idea that uh, we need to, to have data always available, especially when we have like the citizen in the loop, because we need to provide to them like services. So, but I'm just wondering now, because we have uh, sometimes municipalities or, uh, or whatever, I mean, organization that put data available about citizen, and these are public data about ourselves that we don't know that they are collected because uh, might be from cameras or whatever, and then like in London, there are more cameras than everywhere, so I mean. Uh, so now there is a problem, boundary between like privacy, because I'm as a, as a citizen, I would like to contribute to science with my data, but still like in anonymous way, or maybe like getting uh, a service in return. So somehow, let's say that uh, the, the, the privacy policies don't, don't really protect the citizen against any kind of attack that could be done on these uh, public, uh, public data somehow. So I don't know what is the position of the commission uh, with respect of inferring information from uh, public data and then using against the citizen. 
there, there, are, there I can take my private hat and put the hat of the civil servant again, and I can give you the, the official answer. I mean, we, we in the Commission have a whole policy for public sector information, right? There is the directive, there is an obligation of, of, of open access to, to public information. So there is, there is a whole set of, of legislation that deals with the, the gathering and reuse of information by the public authorities on the citizens. What we are talking about here is scientific data, right? Which, by the way, it's an exception to, to the legislation of the public sector information, because at the end of the day, you can say, if the, the governments are paying for science, the data produced in the scientific process is public data. This is not the case, because there is an exception to, 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 the, to the legal framework. So we have a whole set of legislation on, on the public data. And of course that we have a whole set of legislation on data protection and, and, and privacy and, and so on and so forth. So the, the two packages are, 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 are coming around. But uh, as far as I am concerned from a, a scientific data perspective, our fear is exactly the opposite of what you said. Our fear is that the reinforcement of the data protection legislation and legal framework will put in question the open access to scientific data, right? And this is a relationship that we are trying to establish within the Commission with our colleagues that deal with data protection in order to say we need to be very clear with what is data protection and even data that is, that is named, right? I can give you an example of, of a recent thing that I came across which was in the bio, biomedical case uh, field there was uh, uh, there is a kind of uh, uh, um, agreement that can be signed to share data that makes no difference between electronic data and physical data you know the the physical um, i don't know how to say it in english the 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 the, the, the samples of, uh, of 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 blood and so on and so forth and they have made no distinction but they have ensured in this kind of uh, framework agreement or license or you call it whatever you want that there are two levels of, uh, of, of making the data anonymous so there cannot be no <coughs> <coughs> there cannot be no file that makes a correspondence between the name of the originating patient and the number that the number that is written either on the file or on the physical sample, right? There needs to be at least two intermediary indexation indexation levels. So it is possible. I mean, wh wh where I try to, to get is that it is possible and it is feasible to have constraints on the, the anonymous data that, that respect data privacy and at the same time respect open access to data. It's not simple, but it's possible. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I think